discussion. Um, I'm going to invite Sarah Fitzgibbon to moderate this next panel. Sarah is a socially engaged participatory theater maker, and she is also a lecturer in drama and education at TU Conservatoire Dublin. Sarah, thank you for being here. My pleasure. What a great day. It's been fantastic. And um, I'm going to pass over to you to introduce your panel. And Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, um, everybody. And thank you very much, Claire, for your paper. So my name is Sarah Fitzgibbon, and I would like to welcome uh, our panelists for this uh, section. We have uh, Melody uh, Chedamayu and Nelta Chedamayu from the Solo Sirens Collectives, who are uh, divisors and performance on Falling. Uh, we have Jenny MacDonald, the author and performer of Enthroned and director of Falling. We have Deirdre Malloy, the director of Baggage, which was written and performed by Nicola O'Rourke, who was on our earlier panel. And Veronica Coburn, director of Sweet About Me, written and performed by Jacintha Sheeran. We're also delighted to be joined by Sarah Jane Scaife, artistic director of Company SJ and professor in Trinity College Dublin. And lastly, but by no means least, as Sarah Sinnott, who provides us with a unique insight as someone who engaged as an audience member throughout the festival. So welcome to you all. Uh, just I'd like to thank Claire for her paper. Um, on a personal level, when I first read it, I actually got very emotional. I was very affected by the research that you alluded to about um, the uh, synchronicity of heartbeat in performance, um, which we were all kind of uh, missing. And I sincerely hope that we have more of those shared moments of communal engagement in the not too distant future. Um, however, the main thing I took from it, which seems to be a current conversation, and thank you to Melissa for giving us those very concrete actions to address our own language, was the nature of dialogue among women, uh, creating this collaborative floor where the voices combined to construct a shared text. Um, and I think that really resonates with the energies around solo sirens. And so I'd just like to throw that to some of our panelists. Um, uh, was there anything about this jam session devised by a collective, the solos and the sirens, that surprised you? And so I'd like to ask that to Nelta and Melody as a starting point, if they are here. Uh, yeah, so I'll start. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, actually, yes. What I what surprised me? I've never performed before. This was my first time ever, and I didn't know what to expect. So, what surprised me was how the story, the story oh, that we performed in the end, came about. That initially it just seemed like a little bit of conversation. We were having a lot of fun. I didn't see how that was going to actually become a concrete thing that we, mm. we could show anybody. Even when we were in the Abbey at the end of the five days and we had something, we performed for 20 minutes and we were like, oh my God, we did something, you know? <laughs> so that surprised me. The other bit that really surprised me was how caring Jenny is as a director. It, it's like you really felt like you were going home and, and and i'm not saying this in a in a minimalistic or trying to be cliche like going home for me when i got my mom and she holds me in her arms is like my safety place that's mm -hmm. i put my head on a chest and i feel safe and that's how i felt every time i was interacting with jenny and also how open everybody was how everybody was so free to give out or to share those parts of themselves they'd never shared with anybody sometimes. And those parts of themselves that that worried them sometimes, you know, like you are, we don't know how people are going to react when you tell them something, but it was all held. Nobody kind of cried or anything, but it was all held with compassion, kindness and caring. That, that was really surprising to me. I'm curious as an audience member, Sarah, if, if, if you could feel that holding I mean, and that, that kind of layered collaboration of sharing and holding of story. Could you, as an audience member, uh, see that? Um, yeah, when we were watching it, when I was sitting there, I could just feel the connection between everybody and the support that was there. Um, it was very powerful. It was just, they all, you could just see everybody was flourishing, um, especially in the group performance, the last one. Mm. It was just, 
it's very powerful and moving to see everybody together and you could see the comfort and as Melody said like they they looked like they were all home they'd found a safe space and it was just wonderful to see women supporting women in theatre and just seeing that all together it was just yeah it was great to see it from the outside you could just really see everything that had been done. And in terms of that communal feeling of being in that shared theatre space and having that you know where you're synchronizing neurologically and physically with other audience members did you feel in sync with the performers or in sync as an audience or both? I think it was both because it was such an intimate space as well that Mm. you could feel everybody around you was feeling a similar feeling and watching them but you're also connected to the performers because you could feel the emotions they were feeling as well it was just a very kind of spiritual experience I guess as well as an emotional one. Was it a surprise that it was that way? Um yeah a little bit the way that you could just connect with a whole room of people just Mm -hmm. through like I'm involved in performance but just seeing that and the whole room was just together it was slightly surprising yeah excellent no and does anybody else want to come in on that was there anything else about this jam session that surprised you Jennifer Jenny sorry you're grand um something that was interesting for me I suppose I've done this uh this devising process with a number of Mm. groups so the the idea of the devising process as a jam session when I read Claire's paper I was like ah yeah that's that's very familiar and that's what I experience but I was interested to see that that jam within the collective also become a jam with the solo shows and with the audience Mm. and and the degree to which that happened surprised and excited me and we definitely found these commonalities I mean grandmothers there was a grandmother in every show um there was a there was a grandmother who was like the star and the and the savior almost in every show and then there was a mother poor mothers there was a mother with whom there was conflict and there was friction and um so but also so there are these similarities but also there were marked differences and i think uh what was exciting about that for me was that we were such a diverse group so these stories were going from libya to canada to um zimbabwe to ireland uh, and and so in in some ways the joy of the jam was when the stories didn't match. So I was yeah. so struck by Melody saying in the in the talk back after Enthroned, I never grew up with this princess story. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, so, so I and, and that just that was so important for me to hear because it was I I needed to tell I needed to tell my kind of excavation of of doing something different than that story. But it was also really important for me to hear there are many places in the world where that's not the story you know there are there are very there are a lot of stories out there so i yeah i was surprised by and excited by we've talked so much about the support and the agreement and the moments we all came together Mm. but i was also really excited by the moments where we could be really different from one another exactly and sharing those common experiences or uncommon experiences in what becomes that kind of internalized structure that we kind of all can suffer from that, that's really interesting. Um, I just, I, in terms of the, you know, you were talking about holding space and it being a very safe space. And I've watched your process, Jenny, from the outside. Um, is there something to be said that about this fem- female generative space that this festival addresses that the more traditional festivals and commissioning models don't. And I'd like to just throw that out to the wider panel, maybe including Deirdre Malloy and uh, Veronica and uh, Sarah Jane. If you'd like to throw it in. Aha. Aha. (laughs) There you are. Yes, aha. Uh, I have unmuted. I I immediately sort of go, what was the question? Um, Oh, I can give it to you again if you want. (laughs) Well, I think what I'm interested in a a little bit is, um, is, I think what I was struck by uh, with Solo Sirens Festival uh, and a lot of talk about the work is uh, the place of participation. So it's not uh, a straightforward model, as you say, the straightforward commissioning model of we commission the professional Mm. playwright. it is written, it is performed by pro- professional actors and presented in a professional venue. Um, so I think that is, I think it's really interesting how uh, that space, um, you know, we would refer to it, I suppose, back in, uh, uh, I, I shared the 
the 80s with Jane. <laughs> um, but back then we would have used terms like community theatre. But the role of uh, participation and participatory arts and all of that um, and the rise of that, uh, along with probably in gender terms with the freeing up of the female voice is really interesting because, again, mm. one of the dynamics we have is um, the fact that if you put a call out for a participatory project, uh, 95% of the people who respond will be female. Uh, and one little observation I would sort of make as well is that as we talk about uh, the feminine and female within the theatre and our roles and our places and apologising is that even how we talk about uh, general theatre, it's always that sense of um, maybe one of the things that are really interesting about models like Soul of Sirens is this, that you put those voices, you put that work centre stage, you put that audience centre stage and you don't apologise for it. So you just say, here we are, isn't this fantastic? And actually, if you uh, put that further out into general theatre, you say, maybe we should stop apologising for the fact that predominantly audiences are female, predominantly audiences are older females. And rather than say, oh, we should sort of say we should be a bit embarrassed or a bit shy or let's look for the others. Why don't we say we're here? Mm. So, uh, you know, this is fantastic. Let's not look for what is not. Well, of course we should, but um, but let us not in looking to expand those audiences to uh, disrespect uh, or have no regard for the audience that is there. I have you completely. Deirdre Malloy, have you anything to add to that? Um, you know, I come from a kind of a unique background in that I uh, wor I work as an artist, as an actor and a director, but I also work behind the scenes mm -hmm. in on festivals and events. And um, it's nearly all women who, who are on the teams that I work on. Um, so it's it's very interesting to ask that question or to to be to to be asked to think about um why are there why are there not more female events on mm. festivals um i i just i feel that in a rehearsal room um a mixed gender rehearsal room so every rehearsal room is vulnerable, right? Yeah. Everybody feels vulnerable, including the director. It was interesting, Melody, saying that, that Jenny was a really caring director because that's a massive part of the role of a director is to take care of everybody in, in a rehearsal room. But the, the the director themselves are vulnerable as well and they're constantly questioning themselves and and having to question others. So there's this massive vulnerability that I find within a, a more a, a stronger where there's where there are more women are all women that vulnerability is sort of taken care of uh -huh. and you don't you don't need to you don't need to Navigate. you don't need to think about it because uh -huh. it's it's just there people are are looking out for each other and and you know you do have like it was interesting Jane saying that she was 34, 35 years in the industry. I'm 30 and Jane would have been a massive role model for me in my early 20s because she was general manager of Druid and I toured with the show, um, with the Druid show at the time. And she just like very subtly on the sidelines taught me a lot about taking care of yourself as a woman in general, in life, but also in theatre. And you know, they're just that 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 question is constantly coming up of of what why why do we have to? Yeah. Why why does it you know? And and I I just the tools that Melissa gave in what she said, and that Patricia gave just like having an old dance that was amazing <laughs> after lunch. Like I am going to start every day now and every post lunchtime session with like three to five minutes of dancing because it's just a great thing to do. But I just think that women are brilliant at coming up with stuff like that. And, 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 you know, I know we've said it incessantly minding each other, but, but, but I keep going back to the question as others have, which is why, why do we have to, why, why is this still a thing? 
and and that's partly sort of in terms of like i mean i know that we exist slightly outside of what might have been like this is this is a festival that's specific and has given us so much food for conversations and i'm just wondering is that what we need more of is that something that you know um that we talked to, um, a lot about collaborative creation so you as a female director at veronica worked with a female creator writer a direct you know performers on your pieces uh, is there something within making more space for that more generative work do you think i think i think it's I think it's important to have festivals like this and to have, you know, for me personally, to work with somebody like Nicole, who mm. we, ju we just have, we've done so much work together now at this stage. We kind we have a great shorthand, but we also, and I, you know, I said this in the, the panel discussion after baggage, we have this, we come from the same kind of moral, ethical thinking. And it felt being in and around Solar Sirens, it, fe it felt th that that was there with everybody. I mean, not everybody at all times, but there's a there's a a feeling of we're 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 all in this together, and mm. and and a feeling of I suppose the thing the thing that was most important about it for me, um, and then last summer I also for the first time worked in an all female cast in the Abbey. Uh, where you walked into the rehearsal room and you felt like you were walking into a big hug every day. Like it was, <laughs> I had never felt that before. It was just an absolute joy. What what it has taught me personally and professionally is how things should not be. Mm. And how from here on, there are things that I just won't accept within a rehearsal room. There are, there are attitudes and behavior patterns that I you know 30 years on i i can now go okay that's something i'm i won't put up with in, in, a, in, in the sense of is. where melissa was sharing that very practical thing I, i'm mm. just aware i have to want to bring in sarah jane on this can you give us an example of what would those, those, those like that's the line that's 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 the thing i won't tolerate just in terms of a practical thing like melissa gave us with the language um in a word bullying yeah, you know, and there there are so many different versions and so many different levels of that, but that's the the summation of what what I'm talking mm. about. No, that's cool. Thank you very much for sharing that, Sarah Jane. If I could bring you in on the same question, uh, what do you think this festival hits that other may not? Okay, so I feel like a total cheat because <laughs> um, I I only got into this because Martha, who is a student that I was working with. And she's um, amazing. Yeah, you know, she's just amazing. And um, I heard about this through her. So I was really, really interested. But I have no um, experience of the festival. I didn't, nothing. So I'm an absolute and utter cheat. So I'm kind of sitting here wanting to move my little window off the screen. <laughs> um, well, well let me ask you uh, maybe a question in a broader context then mm. that might sort of, um, oh, uh, like we've talked a lot about fe female spaces. So what do you think makes a feminist theatre creation space? Okay, so, I, and I've thought about this, um, and I realized that I've probably been doing it, but without knowing the terms and without exactly. knowing everything. And I remember at the, and Melissa's piece was hilarious because it was like, she was talking to me. I felt like saying, mm. oh, stop it. You know, I even have on my email now that I use in college, I have a, you know, it keeps on kind of giving me flashing lights to stop using all the language that I use to try and soften things or make them, make me less uh, abrupt or aggressive, you know, and it keeps getting me to be more direct. So I just thought that was very interesting with Melissa's thing. But um, back when the Waking the Feminists um, whole thing exploded, uh, I remember talking about the fact that, you know, I mean, I won't even go into all the bullying and all the ridiculous nonsense that happened in the world when Ireland was just controlled totally controlled mm. theatres, writers, producers, directors, everything was men. And I would be having screening matches in the Abbey with Noel Pearson or whatever, or James Flannery or whoever it was, and constantly being this short, 
dancer was another one because that was another thing you shouldn't really be because you were speaking from the body good grief you know not from the intellect <laughs> so being a female and a kind of not that I am a dancer but having had that kind of background reduced me to like this so I was constantly as Melissa was talking about screaming I was constantly shouting and I think people actually thought I was funny almost the guys kind of ooh what a cute little red haired shouty thing in the room <laughs> you know I mean that's really what it felt like you know so um at the waking the feminists um thing I was saying that you know, I got sick of waiting to see whether it would a male director cast me. I got sick of waiting for everything in life. And so I just started doing my own work. And so I think a lot of women around that time, they, they found their own space because they could not bear to wait and they could not bear to be bullied in the situation they were in. So I'm not, I'm not really... Um, um, you know, I put my hand up so much throughout my life and my childhood and everything that um, I, I stopped kind of doing that and I just started trying to do my own work. Mm. So I found a space for myself and it was outside the mainframe. Um, and it's not like, I was trying to say this to Jenny the other day, it's not like I necessarily wanted to go back into the mainframe. I didn't, I found the space, I liked it. So, you know, I was out there exploring and then the fringe becomes the main. So yeah. now areas that a lot of women were exploring, like community, like site specific, you know, uh, like working with, like going around the world, working with women all around the world, you know, um, that wasn't cool. And I was doing all this work in Asia and stuff. And because I wasn't doing stuff on the Abbey or in the Peacock or in the mm -hmm. project, and I wasn't, you know, going around the little circle that we are, when I came home from places, it was like I had never existed, do you know? Um, so, so it was weird, but I didn't want to go into that main space. You know, I wasn't interested in that main space. And I think that a lot of the women created this fringe that is now becoming the main space. Do you mm. know, now site specific, for instance, our community um, engagement, it's all in the main space now. And what we have to, I think, be afraid of or wary of is that main space that's being made up now of all the fringes that we don't become institutionalized or or tight or boxed in like they were you know mm. and so that's the only thing i would say is that i feel like um through my work on beckett who is a man <laughs> the very specific um, I, I feel like I've been injecting the woman into him. I mean, it's it's like, I think there's male Beckett or boy Beckett and girl Beckett. And the boy Beckett is kind of, uh, this is probably a really awful thing to say, but it's kind of like showing the intellect and the philosophical and the, the depth of the argument. And the female Beckett is sneaking in and trying to find what, you know, what, what's going on with the characters. Why are they feeling so fucking you know, lost and meaningless or or is there a meaning in their meaninglessness? And is it just that he's created a space where those voices can be heard? And specifically the women's plays in there and, and to have a, a rehearsal with women is completely different to having a rehearsal with men. And I've worked with both and I love them both really deeply with both groups, but I can kind of manage the men. I can't manage the women. Because they will just, it's like, it's exhausting. You know, uh, Jane, uh, at least Joan Davis, incredible woman in her 70s mm -hmm. dancer. Michelle Forbes, incredibly intelligent um, performer. Breedney Nocton, unbelievable <laughs> experienced woman. And I would come out of the day with them, you know, drained. <laughs> because every single word, every single line. I remember saying to Joan once, um, you know, after I had, bent over backwards, trying not to tell her how to say something, but to give her her way in to say mm. it. Does that help at all, Joan? And she went, no, not really, no, actually <laughs> doesn't really help at all. And, you know, so, the, you, you, you know, it's a whole different space. Mm. But even in terms of the shows we did, like you were talking about the audience, and, and we, we brought our audience, we, it was as important for us to respect the audience and just, there was a community of audience and Kate, um, Kate, not Lappin. Oh my God, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> Kate Lennon. Okay, yeah. so she 
was amazing. And I've only realized now really how amazing she was. Like we would go and look for sites and spaces and everything. But she organized with the, she would get all the people from the festival that were there as um, helpers. And, and she would literally talk to the audience when they came into a building or a site or wherever we were. And she would say, you know, um, we've only limited amount of seating and we've only limited mm. amount of different, you know, can you please be careful for your audience? Can you look around and can you see, is there somebody shorter with maybe um, problems sitting, problems standing, you know, can you please, um, you know, generate a sense of kindness to your audience members? And it was quite amazing because the audience then took care of the piece and they, you know, when they were moving from space to space, they really became aware of each other in mm. the process of witnessing these women's stories that weren't these mad women that a lot of the time is portrayed, you know, the Beckett women. They were women who really had a story to tell. And they were very clearly trying to tell their story in a very difficult, um, crazy scenario of a male world. And, um, you know, for me, that was amazing. Um, you know, I, I don't even know what, mm. I have no, no idea. No, because I think, I think what you, if I was to sort of, condense down a um, couple of the things that you said there one of them was if you don't like the the sort of generated rules of the game go and make your own game mm. which I think is a very important one for for us to give permission to the younger generation of theatre makers Absolutely. coming up that like you know you you can create the rules of your game and make your space as you wish it to be once it's with respect and and those kind of things but the other thing that I'm curious about is that sense of do you think a feminist theatre space or one that tells a female story is a more inclusive space by its very nature? I, I do think that um especially in the dance area as well um but but i i just would have a little warning uh thing in my head going don't create the same restrictions that that became uh, embedded because yeah. you look at the arts council criteria now you know social engagement this is the big buzzword now and it's the whip that you're going to you know lose funding over um again you know um i don't know i just I think that, you know, really interesting things are created at the fringe and they come in and then they get boxed off into, okay, now we know what the answer what you is. Do. Now we know what to do and this is what we're going to do. And you have to fit into this now. It's, I kind of would love the idea of it just constantly, you know, fluid, which is, I suppose, what we do. I can, I can see Veronica Coburn nodding a lot to that so I'd just like to invite her to come in and maybe respond to that because you were you were nodding sagely there Veronica. Oh yeah that, that's uh, yes that's just a facade. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I tell you I, I would like to sort of hop back in and I'd like to sort of take a yeah. little backward step which is sure, that notion first. of um, do we need festivals uh, like Solo Sirens and what I would say so I'm going to take a little step sideways first and come back to that which is um, I run a programme called Tenderfoot in the Civic, which is which for is transition awesome. year students. So 15, 16 year olds, we bring them in every year. We, uh, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about shaping and giving space for a uh, youth artistic voice. So core to it is that young people write plays. Um, so we've been going since 2007 and uh, I love these little numbers. So just before we started, I suddenly thought, oh, I bet you these numbers will be useful. So every year we take about 50 students uh, in the first year it was about 35, now it's about 50. This year we're taking 65. Uh, we'll have to stop that at some point. Um, so since 2007, we have had 571 uh, 15 and 16 year olds take part in our programme. Now in the programme, uh, we write plays, but we also do set design, costume design, uh, music composition, and they get to perform and they get to do stage management. So not all of them write. But of the 571 young people who have come through our hands, 224 of them have written plays. Some of those plays have been three pages long. Some of them have been 40 pages long. Of the 224 plays written, we have produced 
because it's not about keeping it on the sidelines. It's about putting it on the stage. We have produced 82 of those plays written by 15 and 16 year olds, and they are performed to a peer audience. So a peer audience see work that is from their viewpoint. Of the 82 plays that we have produced since 2007, 64 have been written by young women. That is 78%. So That is amazing. But you see, the interesting thing is, now there's many, there's loads of digging to be done there. I'm yeah. not saying anything, but there's loads of digging. But the numbers do speak for themselves. So what is interesting is what happens. So obviously at age 15 and 16, young women are quite capable of writing plays and saying, this is my voice, put it up there on the stage. So what happens between the time that they're 15 and 16 and that they're 24, 25 year old uh, young writers? Where are those voices then? So there's something in terms of the system that means yeah. they get lost or they are ignored or they are not supported in the intervening years. So what I would say is in terms of a, a festival like Solo Sirens, is it needed? Yes. We want to get to a point where we do not need festivals like Solo Sirens. We want to get to a point where we can, we want festivals which are specifically about women's work. We want them because we can enjoy them, uh, but not because we need them. Mm. And the other little point I'll make in there is the notion of uh, a cumulative effect. I think the usefulness of a festival rather than a one-off play. So three plays by professional artists alongside a, a play that is participatory in nature is fantastic because individually they will all make a mark, but collectively they make yeah. a bigger mark. Uh, it's the same with our young people in, you know, in South Dublin County. If we'd stopped after year one, uh, yeah. it would just go poof. It's taken us, this is now what our 14th year, 14 years later, finally the numbers are gathering so that it has some sort of meaning. So I think for now we do need and we probably need more so that we get to the point when we don't need. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. I'm going to be chased off because we're You're running over there. time. But I'm I have here. to say it was just fabulous. Um, I, I, I think one of the things that I think I, I will certainly take away from this conversation, and I, I'm so glad to see so many people who were involved in third level education in theatre and drama studies here, that that call, like what happens, what happens to that 16, between 16 and 24. And I think that the onus is on us to make sure that those internalised, you won't be heard voices get stopped and nipped before they overtake these young female writers. Thank you very much for that, Veronica. So I'm going to hand over to Jennifer Webster before she comes after me with <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> now we, and thank you to your panel. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes to open up to the floor to any of the attendees who would like to ask a question to your panel. So we will begin now in a second. Just waiting on those questions to come in. So to ask a question, you can either put a question into the Q&A. If you'd like to ask the question live, just type in live and we will promote you and you'll be able to, to see your face there. So. Um, while we're waiting for questions, can I just say uh, one thing that came to mind while listening to Sarah Jane and Veronica there? Um, as as a as a young woman and and as an older woman i have all of my life by people who were very important in my life been told to be less emotional mm. women are too emotional we calm down relax you know rein it in and and like fuck that <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like we should be emotional and 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 that's we, women are emotional and, and we should let it out and we should we should allow whatever we're feeling to be out there and not feel like we have to behave in a male manner in order mm -hmm. to be heard. Mm -hmm. I don't mean scream and roar and rage. I mean, 
do do that by all means. But but don't be afraid of of being emotional. I think I think you're dead right. I think it's Claire's paper really brings just to bring it back because I love that idea of bringing things to rent to a full circle in the sense that Claire's com- the conversations that I've had having read Claire's paper about the nature of female dialogue being different to men um, being different to that taking the floor and stepping back being that collaborative almost patchwork quilt in which emotions are readily shared and echoed and mirrored and so on like that has had a very transformative effect I know on how I view conversation um, and I think that that's that's a, that's a very interesting thing in terms of shouting and roaring, being emotional, but being having other people chime in and say, you're right to be. Mm-hmm. You know? OK, first question. Right. And let me know who would like to answer it. Is there a female aesthetic, not just a female perspective? Who would like to answer that? Sarah Jane. We'll unmute you now, Sarah Jane. And um, just really, really quickly, because I don't want to take because, yeah, and um, I just think there definitely is because um, over the years, if you look at critics and if you you see the way they view things, um, it's very, very different how a male critic will write um, about a show they've seen and a female cr- critic, I feel. So I think it's in some way the way they're looking at uh, the piece really changes, um, it seems to me. I can remember a, a show we did years ago in the Peacock where we added a lot of very slow movement before a, a Yates play. Literally, the uh, the critics were split in two. The men ranted and raved and said, how dare you? And the women went, oh my God, you know, we were brought into this other kind of space and this other world. And it was literally so completely different. And I have noticed it over the years reading critics so so if you know i think there has to be a different um aesthetic there it's more layered or something i feel like with women and i'm not saying one is better than the other but i think it's more layered possibly more subtle the female aesthetic thank you thank you how do we empower the younger feminist voices in continuing the legacy of solo sirens into the future so whoever would like to, to take, I'll repeat it again. How do we empower the younger feminist voice in continuing the legacy of solo sirens into the future? You've got Melody, thank you. Uh, so I think that being an immigrant to Ireland, I find that there's a lot of and we do that to each other actually as women sometimes, especially with younger women. We tell them to shut up a lot. We also try to control them, to tell them not to express themselves. Like one of my, do- my daughter's friends, way back when they were in primary school, used to say, I love coming to your home because sometimes you're just, your mom just goes into a dance and, and it's fun. Whereas if I laugh too loudly, my mom tells me to shut up. Don't do that. Don't do that to your girls because it's just there. By the time they're 15, 16, it's already usually too late because they already formed what they think is how they should be. So allow young people to express themselves and to say what they want to say. And even if you don't agree with it, you can just listen. You don't have to comment. And yeah, so I think that's, that's all I can say on the subject. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to add to that as well. It's something that came to me from uh, one of my brothers, actually. Um, uh, I, I was telling one of my nieces one time how gorgeous she is. You're so beautiful. You're so pretty. And and my brother, Aidan, said to me, would you mind, like, that's grand, but would you mind also, you know, like every time you talk to her about being beautiful, will you also just be sure and tell her she's really smart and she's really strong as well? And I was like, fuck, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, like it's such a basic thing that, that, that you know, these, these are just ways that we communicate with young women that is so ingrained in us. And, you know, so just be really, just make a point of telling young women that women that they're smart and they're strong. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Um, Courtney, Helen Grawley would like to ask a question live. Can we promote her there? We have so many questions that are coming up in the Q&A. We will have an informal chat after the symposium and hopefully maybe we can get to some of those questions then. Um, my apologies, we're kind of tight for time. So if we can promote Courtney there. Hi, uh, thank you. I, I had to ask this live because I, I am still working out the question in my head, but it's around the idea of the waking the feminists. Uh, prior to coming to Ireland to start my PhD studies, I was working with a regional theater company in San Francisco, in which I experienced being told, A, not to be so emotional, and then being accused of not caring about something when I was trying to not be emotional in this space and it, it's kind of nerve wracking. And um, it's really inspiring to hear about the alternative spaces that have been created um, and have been taken over by women. But I, I wonder if those of you who have been in Ireland since the Waking the Feminist movement, if you have seen a change in women's voices within um, theaters around Dublin, so in the alternative spaces, but also in those mainstream larger institutions as well. Thank you. Absolutely, but not enough would be my answer. We need more. Would anyone else like to respond to? Um, yeah, I mean, Jen, uh, is great in the Abbey, I have to say. You know, she's, yeah. she's a, a constant open ear. Um, yeah. No, I would totally agree, totally yeah. agree. We're going to close this panel discussion now. We do have, we will have, we have kept the questions that are in the Q&A and we will ask them at the end of the session. Now what we're going to show you is a video of our Solo Sirens collective artist, Samara Chedi, in a dance piece with music by Farah L. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> 